Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come in. Um, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Deb, and I am the sales director here for Independent Living at Capital Lakes. And um, I wanted to also introduce Holly. Holly is just walking in the door behind John. <laughs> um, we do have all different levels of care here. We have independent living, we have assisted living, we have skilled nursing, memory care, and rehab. Um, today, if you noticed, um, if you didn't have a chance to pick one of these up, this is called a self-guided tour. Um, so if any of you are interested, we do have a couple of our apartments in independent living that are open if you would want to step through, take a quick look, feel free. Um, if you have any questions, just contact either myself or Holly, and we'd be happy to show you how to get to um, either of the apartments. And then the other information that I have out there, um, this is just a little pamphlet on Capital Lakes and the different levels of care. So, you know, if you have any questions, we're happy to help you with that as well. And then, um, last but not least, we do have our course catalog that's also out on the table. Um, we put together an election series um, this year, and we have a couple more that are left uh, this month. So if you're interested in signing up for those, please feel free to do so. And um, today with me, I have a resident, and his name is Crawford Young, and he is no stranger to the University of Wisconsin. Um, he is actually going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> um, it's a great pleasure. Uh, to introduce Barry Burton, uh, who is going to speak to us on uh, the changing electoral laws and the 2016 campaign. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you are well aware that there have been in Wisconsin important changes in the rules for uh, voting. Uh, which have been, depending on your perspective, either to combat voter fraud or alternatively to uh, suppress voting from minorities, students, and other some other categories. Um, uh, Barry, uh, I can't quite refer to as a former colleague in the UW Political Science Department since he came joined the staff five years after I had retired, but uh, I have heard him hold forth before, and uh, I can promise you that this will be a very stimulating presentation. Uh, his major works, he after, after his uh, PhD at Ohio State University, pause for booze. <laughs> personal roots of representation and uh, why uh, Americans split their tickets, campaign uh, competition and uh, divided goals. Uh, he is a director of a newly created elections research center, which is quite a major undertaking. Uh, um, it, uh, um, has the involvement of uh, quite quite a number of people. Uh, I give you Barry Burton and look forward to the presentation. Thanks for having me. Let me make sure you can all hear me before I go too far with the presentation. Uh, this is really a wonderful series you have going on the 2016 election. I understand you've had a couple of speakers in already. A couple of my colleagues, in fact, and a couple more to go, including a talk about third party candidates coming up. I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff that they're covering. I'm not going to cover the personalities of the candidates. We're not going to talk about the issues, the platforms, the vice presidential debate that's happening tonight, any of that. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on the mechanics of elections, the laws and administration 
that govern how we run elections in Wisconsin and in the United States more generally. And I want to put this in the context of a lot of litigation that's been happening this year and over the past few years. I've been an expert witness in uh, some of those trials, and I'd be happy to talk about those. There are a number of states now where uh, not just voter ID laws, but all kinds of provisions, uh, voter registration rules, purging of voter lists, early and absentee voting, all of those things have become highly contentious and have been fought out in state and federal courts in these and other states. Uh, a lot of this activity was generated after the Supreme Court decision in Shelby County v. Holder a few years back, which took away a lot of the prohibitions on a number of southern states where uh, they had had to get preclearance to make changes. Now those changes can go ahead and that's spawned some lawsuits from people who are not happy with the changes. Uh, and one of the things I want to examine today is the effect of these laws on voter participation rates. And so I want to give you just as context what voter turnout rates look like across the states in the last presidential election. Uh, Wisconsin, I'm happy to say, is one of the highest and has a proud tradition of high levels of participation. This is the states ranked from lowest turnout, which I think was Hawaii at 44% in 2012, all the way up through the highest, which I think was Minnesota at 78%. Wisconsin typically runs just behind Minnesota in turnout, we're around 77%. Um, so uh, they beat us in turnout, we beat them in football, it seems like a fine arrangement. Uh, you can also see it looks like sort of a weather pattern that there's kind of a high front centered around the upper Midwest, uh, maybe around the Twin Cities, high levels of turnout there, and maybe also in New England, and lower levels of turnout, particularly in the deep south and central part of the country. So there are some cultural factors and political factors that go into this in addition to how states actually run their elections. So here's a fundamental fact we can't get around. Uh, the United States is different from other democracies in that elections are run by the states. They have a tremendous amount of latitude. They get that latitude from the US Constitution, which says that the times, places, and manner of holding federal elections are run by the states. It's right there. That makes it very difficult and unlikely that the federal government will be involved in any way to make elections more uniform in their administration. Uh, this is a wonderful thing in that there are lots of experiments happening in the states. Some states are now running their elections entirely by mail. They have no polling places at all. Other states are allowing for innovations in registration. Uh, the state of Oregon, for example, is now going to register essentially every voter automatically unless they opt out. So there are lots of interesting things that can happen, uh, but some of those things can go in the wrong direction. And this is where the wrong direction began. You will all remember the 2000 presidential election. Hard to imagine that was 16 years ago, but it was. Uh, November of that year, we did not know on election night whether the person on the left or the person on the right was going to be the next president of the United States. In fact, we didn't know for 37 days. You might remember your Thanksgiving meals that year. We were still talking about the election <laughs> at the end of November. That uh, event put a spotlight on the details of election administration, how ballots are designed, how voter registration happens, uh, how people cast and verify their ballots. All of that was put under the spotlight and has spawned this wave of uh, changes to election laws and litigation and what one of my colleagues calls the voting wars. These matters were not really a source of partisan dispute until 2000. There was lots of agreement on what to do. It was not something that the Democrats and Republicans were fighting about. Today, they're fighting about it. This is, this is actually one of the issues in most campaigns is how we run the elections that come at the end of those campaigns. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about four kinds of election procedures and what the lay of the land looks like and what political science has to say about the likely effects of those procedures. Um, I wanna call them the good, bad, and the ugly, but they're actually four, so maybe two of them are ugly. You can decide which. So here's the first we'll talk about quickly. That's election day registration, an option that exists in Wisconsin. So we'll spend some time on that. Second topic I want to cover is absentee and early voting, or what generally gets called early voting. Any ballots that are cast before election day. Tremendous variation in that and lots of dispute about those issues. 
redistricting. This is my favorite map of the Wisconsin eight congressional districts, indicated by which party tends to win them. And then finally, the hot button issue of voter identification. All right, so let's start at the top. Election day, or what's sometimes called same day voter registration, it's a practice that allows a voter to become registered and cast a ballot in the same place, essentially all in one step. Right? It joins what, it, for many people, are two different steps. The registration step has to happen before an election, and then the casting of a ballot that happens later. There are now about eight or nine or 10 states that have some version of same-day registration, including Wisconsin. And this just gives you a sense for what those states are. They tend to be on that map where the high fronts were in the upper Midwest and in New England, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, this is the, the practice in Wisconsin has uh, been on the books since 1976 here, so it's a long-running practice. And people use it. On average, about one in 10 voters, about 10%, of voters who live in states that provide this option use it. Many of them are not new registrants. They're people who are simply updating their registration. They moved from one location to another. They changed their name. And same day registration lets them do that on the fly and cast a ballot without a hiccup. Unsurprisingly, I think, uh, same day registration seems to increase voter turnout. The upper line here are voter turnout rates in the states that have same-day registration. The bottom line are states that don't have same-day registration. And the gap is about 10 percentage points. So turnout rates are about 10 points higher in states that have this option. Now, not all of that 10 points is due to same-day registration. These states also have other things happening that make them high turnout rates. But I'm going to show you in a moment that, in fact, same-day registration does, in fact, increase turnout. So what does the political science research have to say about the effect of election day registration? Well, let me give you a sense of what the scholarly literature has to say without forcing you to read any of it. This is the boiled down version. Uh, the, the number one consensus is that election day registration increases turnout. And the, I think the literature has settled on a range of about three to six percentage points. Not quite the 10 percentage points I showed you a moment ago, but it does increase turnout. It does not get US voter turnout up to the levels of our European uh, fellow democracies in Europe, uh, but it does have a positive effect. Uh, so a general consensus on that. But the effect is not uniform across all the states. The effects seem to be bigger in the states that first adopted election day registration, what are called the first wave states back in the 1970s. Those would be states like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, those states seem committed to the practice, promote it, use it heavily, train their election officials to take advantage of it. And states that came later, second wave or third wave states that adopted it in the 1990s or in the 2000s, seem somewhat less committed to the practice and have um, lesser effects of election day registration. It does have some other benefits. Uh, one study shows that states with election day registration have less economic inequality in who votes. In other words, the differences between voters and non-voters are smaller. They're more alike in states that have election day registration. That's probably a good thing. Uh, election day registration also reduces something known as provisional ballots. If you've lived in Wisconsin a long time, you don't know what this is, and that's a good thing. Uh, in every state, if a voter arrives at the polling place ready to cast a ballot, and there's some dispute about their eligibility to vote, they are given a provisional ballot. The dispute might be, I think I'm registered, and the poll worker says I'm not on the books, or I think this is my name, and the poll book lists something else, or I don't have the right identification to cast a ballot, or someone's challenging me for not being eligible in some other way. In those cases, the person's given a provisional ballot, they can, ca they can submit that ballot and walk away from the polling place, but they need to return typically to a clerk's office within a few days to validate that ballot in some way with some other documentation. So a lot of those provisional ballots don't, up being, don't end up being counted, and they're a real hassle and a source of legal battles after the election. Election day registration makes that problem go away. It makes that problem go away. You simply re-register on the spot. Other benefits, uh, election day registration increases the accuracy of the voter rolls, something we all have an interest in. When a person can update their name or address at the polls, we know at that moment that their record is complete and up to date. Right? So it has this 
uh, side effect of, of keeping things um, modern and looking like the electorate actually looks. So I think on the good, bad, and the ugly scale, election day registration must be the good. It just has lots of benefits uh, and very few downsides. That's not going to be the case when we look at these other three reforms. So let's go to number two, absentee and early voting. Widely used across the United States. Uh, you'll see that just about any state with a color has some form of absentee or early voting. The green states are the most generous. They have early voting and uh, absentee voting by mail without an excuse. Uh, the states that are blue have actually opened up early voting centers of some kind in many cases. Uh, there are a few states out west that now do elections by mail. There are no polling places. Everyone sent a ballot in the mail automatically. Uh, but there are places, uh, particularly in New England, some in the south, uh, some in the Midwest, that really have no version of earlier absentee voting and require essentially everyone to go to a traditional polling place on election day. So we have everything from essentially 100% of voters casting their ballots early in some of these western states to a very small percentage doing it in places like Pennsylvania or Virginia. So this is, this is part of what the Constitution allows. But even with this variation, there's been a tremendous change, a tremendous increase in the use of early voting. Just 20 or 30 years ago, a very small share of the electorate was casting their ballots before Election Day. As late as uh, even the 2000 election, only about one in 10 ballots cast before traditional Election Day. Today, we're talking about one in three ballots for president being cast before Election Day. And in fact, voting is underway in Wisconsin and a bunch of other states. About 100,000 people have voted nationwide already. Uh, whether this trend continues to increase or not, I'm, it's not clear. It looks like it's plateaued a little bit in the last couple of cycles. Uh, but the truth is, um, a lot of people are doing this, uh, and particularly in some states that really facilitate it. Now, what does the scholarly literature have to say about this, absentee and early voting? Here's where you're going to get some surprises. Uh, one study suggests that when a state introduces early voting or absentee voting, voter turnout does increase by a small amount. I think that's the conventional wisdom. But that's one study. Two other studies find a small positive effect on turnout when absentee voting is offered, but actually a negative effect on turnout when in-person early voting is offered. So mixed effects. And a couple of other studies, including one of mine, finds a negative effect of any kind of early voting. When a state offers either absentee voting or early voting in person, voter turnout tends to fall. And early voting, when it's introduced, actually makes the inequality in participation greater, not smaller. So whereas election day registration made voters and non-voters more alike, early voting tends to make that gap even bigger. So this is a really mixed message, uh, maybe more negative than positive if voter turnout is the aim of these laws. Uh, voters do like them. They appreciate the convenience of having many days and many ways to cast ballots. But it's really not at all clear from the research that introducing these options has much of a positive effect on turnout. Uh, there are a couple of caveats. One caveat has to do with voting on the weekends, and in particular, voting on Sunday. In some communities, particularly in African American communities, there's a real movement to get people out to the polls after a Sunday church service. Something called Souls to the Polls, you may have heard of. Uh, I think was part of an effort in Milwaukee and in North Carolina, Virginia, and some other states. Uh, and it looks like offering voting on that particular day has benefits for some groups in terms of turnout. But in general, the message is not that absentee and early voting do much to increase turnout, although they may do other good things. We'll come back to this one. All right, so in the good, bad, and the ugly, where are we? Is this bad? I don't know. It's a mix. Uh, it's an ugly mix. Let's talk about redistricting, the drawing of district lines for both Congress and state legislature. Show you a couple of examples of this from states you might know. Here are our friends in Iowa. Iowa has four congressional districts. You can see them there. They're, they're faintly colored, but I think you can see them. Uh, they're pleasant looking districts. They're kind of square. Uh, they meet in the middle of the state. They follow county lines. You can see the counties there. They tend not to break counties up. This is our state with its eight congressional districts, also lightly shaded, not so nice looking, 
Uh, the second district where we live is sort of squarish, but you'll see the third district kind of goes in different directions. There's a section along the Mississippi River, and then there's another piece that sort of runs up to Wausau. And some other districts, like the sixth, sort of run almost to Dane County and then all the way up to almost to Door County. Um, the eighth district kind of wraps around there in a funny way. Wisconsin is not the most egregious in this respect, but it just gives you a sense for the range of things. Uh, this difference is not surprising because the way districts are drawn in Iowa is different from what most other states do. Most states do what Wisconsin does, which is let the state legislature and the governor draw the maps. They pass the maps the way they pass any other piece of legislation. The House and the Senate get together and draw some maps and the governor signs it into law. In Iowa, they decided to take that process away from the state legislature and the governor. They give it to an existing state agency, which is told to draw some maps when it's time, every 10 years, using data on the population, but not using any information about where incumbent legislators live, so not trying to draw them favorable districts, and not having any information about the partisanship of voters. So they're blind to that information, and they simply produce a kind of mechanical map and give it to the state legislature where it has to be voted up or voted down. And that process tends to produce these kinds of maps, which are nicer looking and more competitive, generally. So what does the literature have to say about redistricting? Well, uh, not as much as we would like. Thinking about the, the two negative side effects that people worry about most, that redistricting will cause polarization of the parties, because Democrats represent very Democratic districts and Republicans represent very Republican districts, or that incumbents might win re-election more often and we might not have competitive elections because of the way districts are drawn. Uh, that turns out to be not so much due to districting or gerrymandering, or gerrymandering as I call it, named after Elbridge Gerry, but do more to the way people are living. It turns out that Democrats and Republicans don't live with each other, and they do it less today than in the past. Uh, we've sequestered ourselves geographically so that our neighbors, our coworkers, our spouses tend to be of the same party today in a way they were not in the past. And Democrats, in particular, live in really tight geographic areas. If you, if you look at a map of the United States showing all the votes in all the precincts around the country, you'll see bright blue areas that tend to be in inner cities, in college towns, or along the water. That, that's where Democrats live. And Republicans tend to be in suburbs that ring around those cities, so you'll see red donuts around each of the blue dots, or in rural communities. And that gives the Republicans actually some advantage because of the distribution of their voters just being more convenient for drawing districts. It's very hard not to have a district with a lot of Democrats in it once you draw one around a central city or college town or something else. So that concentration leads to districts that are lopsided and polarized in a way that districting, it's the process itself, uh, can't change very much. Uh, but there are some things that can be done uh, using a non-legislative districting method, giving the process to a commission or a state agency or a court tends to make districts a little bit more competitive, modestly more competitive. It doesn't change elections wildly, but the research is saying it has some benefits. And in some states, uh, districting actually in state law has some criteria that come with it. So the people who draw maps have to meet some criteria, and it's possible to put into that list that we want districts to be politically competitive or potentially competitive, and doing that does seem to increase competition to some degree. Uh, there are a lot of downsides to the legislature having control over districting. I'll just mention a few of them without mentioning the literature that goes with it. Uh, in Wisconsin, we know that the districting process was very expensive, about $3 million that the majority party spent hiring a private law firm to draw maps in this last cycle. Uh, the Iowa process, I think they've testified that it cost them a couple hundred dollars because they had to hold public hearings and so they had to drive people to some place in a van, uh, and that was the main cost. Um, so very different in, in, in the, on the cost side of things. In Wisconsin, I, I would say the process is legally ambiguous, that maps in the, in the latest cycle were drawn in a, a private law firm rather than on public property. And so how open records laws and public access to that information plays out, I think, is unclear. Uh, Wisconsin and other states have been litigious. There's a lawsuit uh, we're still waiting to hear about 
having to do with the state legislative districts in Wisconsin, but it's also true in many other states. In Iowa, there's never been a lawsuit. Right? This, this just sort of mechanically happens. The maps get approved. People live with them and move on. And maybe worst, I think, is that in, the, in a year that begins, in, uh, that begins after the latest census, one of the first things the legislature does out of the gate is begin to draw the new maps. And I think by that happening at the beginning of the legislative term, it essentially contaminates relationships between the parties for the rest of that session. Democrats and Republicans move to secret quarters and do the map making, and the majority party tends to come back with its maps and essentially force them down the throat of the minority party. And that doesn't do a lot to create positive relationships that might spill over to other legislation down the road. Um, one thing I will say about Wisconsin, uh, the latest maps I think are really effective. They were drawn by a Republican majority, and uh, they did a good job of trying to get as many Republican seats out of the vote as possible. And generally, the parties have become more effective at this. Uh, there have been a number of lawsuits around districts, but when it's about partisanship, judges and courts tend not to want to be involved. They say, well, that's a, just a partisan matter. That's not something for the courts to be involved in. You're not discriminating against people based on their race or uh, something else where there might be a protection in the law. So we don't want to be involved. But it turns out there's now a case coming up through federal court here in Wisconsin that I would not be surprised uh, if it were decided by the US Supreme Court that would set a standard for how much partisan gerrymandering is acceptable. And it's based on this idea that uh, two academics have come up with called an efficiency gap. The efficiency gap is a measure of how egregious the maps are in terms of hurting one party relative to the other. And the case is uh, this Whitford et al. case, which will be decided any day uh, here in Madison. We've been waiting for a few months now. Let me give you a sense where the Wisconsin maps fit on this efficiency gap scale. This is one of the uh, exhibits that appeared in court in this case. And along the bottom is a measure of the efficiency gap a higher number means the districts were drawn in a way that advantaged Democrats, so they've wasted the votes of Republicans, essentially. And lower numbers mean that the maps advantage Republicans, and they've essentially wasted the votes of Democrats. These lines indicate all of the maps in any state legislature over the last 40 years, from 1972 until 2014. So some of them favored the Democrats, some of them favored the Republicans, a lot of them were pretty equally balanced. That red line, if you can see it in the lower left, is the current Wisconsin map. So it's about the third or fourth most favorable map drawn in the last 40 years in any state for one particular party. So the litigants in this case are saying there ought to be a standard using this efficiency gap measure where once you're, you're beyond the zero point a certain degree, courts can say, OK, that's enough. We're going to force you to redraw the maps and make them somewhat more competitive. So this is one to watch. Uh, Wisconsin may be a trendsetter uh, on this issue. Okay, let's get to the last. This is the ugly, the fourth of the four things I want to cover, voter identification laws. Every state has voter identification of some kind. Every state has voter identification of some kind. The question is, what do you require of voters to identify themselves? In some states, it's as simple as saying your name and address. That's the standard in most states. In other states, a little more is required. Maybe signing a poll book, maybe giving the last four digits of your social security number or something else. In other states, there are a variety of forms of ID that a person can show. And in a small number of states, there's a very strict list of a small number, usually of government IDs, that are acceptable. So there's a lot of variation in this. And again, the Constitution gives states the right to do this. You'll see in the darkest green states, uh, those are the places where the laws are the strictest. Aside from Wisconsin and Indiana, these tend to be states in the South. Uh, Texas is not listed there, but it has a fairly strict law now. North Carolina had a strict law, and it was just struck down by an appeals court this summer. So in these five or six states, uh, voters have to show one of typically five or six approved forms of identification, something like a driver's license, a passport, a military ID, a tribal ID, in some states a student ID, in some states a gun license, in some states immigration papers or naturalization papers. So it tends to be a small enumerated list. But you'll see that the most common pattern actually is the gray states, where there's no document required at all. A voter simply states their name and address. That was the process in Wisconsin until about five years ago. Uh, but things have been moving along in this direction.
Uh, voter ID does one thing in particular. It is designed to deter people from impersonating other voters at the polls. That's the one kind of crime that it, it would be most effective at reducing. Uh, it turns out that voter impersonation is a pretty rare activity. Uh, this is from Vox, based on some research that Justin Levitt, who's a professor at Loyola Law School and now a lawyer in the Justice Department, put together. Uh, these are not actual cases of voter impersonation. These are just allegations that were credible enough that he thought it was worth counting them. So he looked over elections from uh, the last 14 years, came up with about 35 cases that looked like they might have been situations where a voter had voted on the basis of someone else, had impersonated another voter, and during that time, about 834 million votes had been cast in federal elections. So it's not a non-existent problem, but it's a trivial problem in terms of the concerns we have about the integrity of the election system. If policymakers were to come to people like me, to academics who study the stuff, and say, you know, we want to, we want to improve the security of the system, where should we look? Voter impersonation would not be the place we would start. We would, you know, absentee voting, the voter registration process, there are other places where there are more vulnerabilities. So what does research have to say about voter ID? Uh, well, we now have a pretty good consensus showing that when a strict ID law is enacted, voter turnout tends to go down. Uh, best estimates are about two to three percentage points overall. So we know that. Voter ID laws tend not to affect how trusting or confident people are in the election system. Proponents of the laws say they're helpful because it makes people think the election system is working better if we have some strictness in what people are required to show. Opponents of the law say having these laws might actually reduce confidence or trust in the system by being overly harsh. It turns out there's no relationship between those two things, how, how strict an ID law is in a state and what level of trust people have in the election system uh, turn out to be unrelated to one another. Uh, there are people who don't have the IDs that are needed. Uh, in the Wisconsin litigation, it was estimated that about 300,000 Wisconsinites who are already registered to vote wouldn't have the IDs that are needed to vote under the law. That's something like 8 or 9% of the electorate, depending on how you count it. Uh, there would also be people who are not yet registered to vote who wouldn't have ID, uh, but this is just among registrants. I mentioned already not much evidence of voter impersonation, so it, it looks a little bit like a solution in search of a problem or just not a solution that's well tailored to the concerns that policymakers might have. With all the litigation that's happening, there's a lot of confusion in the electorate about exactly what is required of voters. We've seen that in surveys in Wisconsin. The Mar Mar Marquette Law Poll has asked in its last few administrations what people think the law is as the law has been moving around in the courts and a fair number of voters are wrong about that and that's been true in other states in Pennsylvania, Texas and elsewhere uh, where the law has been in flux. So there is some burden on the state to make sure that people are informed about what's required if they're going to be required to show something. Uh, but there are some upsides. Um, notifying people that there's an ID requirement, telling them this is coming and you need to do something about it in one experimental study showed that voter turnout rates went up when that was done. Um, so we're still learning a lot about this process, but this is what we know so far. One thing I want to mention more, in more depth is this first point about voter turnout declining when a strict ID law gets adopted. That's, that estimate of two or maybe three percentage points is an overall effect. Overall turnout drops by that amount. But we suspect that turnout drops more in some groups than others, depending in part on their access to IDs. And that, in fact, is what the research has been showing, that the effects of these ID laws are not equal across groups. So I'm going to show you here a study done by the, General, uh, by the Government Accountability Office in Washington, the GAO, which I think is the latest and most sophisticated study of all of this. They examined turnout rates in two states, Kansas, which is the light blue, and Tennessee, which is the darker blue, purple color, two states with strict ID laws, and compared those states to other states that were like them, but didn't happen to have the ID laws. So it's sort of like an experiment. What happens when you impose this on a state compared to other states that are like them? And they looked at the effects on turnout of people by age, by race, and by how long they had been registered to see whether the effects were uniform or differentiated. So the first one on the left are turnout rates by age, 
Remember, the overall effect is to decrease turnout by about two percentage points. Well, it turns out that that effect is greater among young people than among old people. You can see that the effect is anywhere from four to nine points among the youngest group in the electorate, and it decreases as people age. Presumably, as one ages, you're more likely to have a driver's license, to have a passport, to have the other kind of ID documents that would be helpful. So not only does it affect the number of people who vote, but it affects the kinds of people who vote. Right? It's likely to skew the electorate against uh, younger people participating. Among racial and ethnic groups, again, the overall effect is about two percentage points, but it looks to be bigger among African-American voters. The effects are about four or five percentage points, and smaller among Asian-Americans, Hispanics, and whites. So there's a disparity there, and, and that matches what we know about who possesses IDs in these various groups pretty well. And then finally, the effects differ depending on how long you've been registered in the state. People who have registered recently in the last year, two years, or three years have uh, faced a bigger effect of the ID law than those who have been in the state for longer. Okay, and presumably that correlates with whether people have the IDs they need to vote. So I think there are a lot of real concerns here and a lot of the litigation around voter ID in Wisconsin and Texas and North Carolina and some other states has been around these issues. Not whether the effect, not whether the ID law is burdensome, but whether the burden is felt unequally across demographic groups and might then violate the Voting Rights Act or some other federal law. Uh, so that's where, that's where the, the spate of decisions you've seen this spring and summer have been mostly around these issues. All right, so that's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I wanna take your questions, but let me give you a few caveats to what I've said so far. First of all, most of what I've shown you has been about presidential elections. Those are the kinds of elections that political scientists tend to be most interested in and do research about. Aside from redistricting, the research I showed you on same-day registration, on early voting, on voter ID, tends to be in presidential years. And it may be that those effects are different in midterm elections or special elections or primaries or something else. Uh, we're very much in the process of learning about all of those things. Uh, second is there may be a different effect of introducing an option to voters, adding something to the election law versus taking it away. And in particular, my research suggests that early and absentee voting, when it's introduced, doesn't have much positive effect on turnout and might actually reduce it. But once you take it away, the effect is much more disruptive and tends to lower levels of turnout more than introducing it did in the first place. So there's this kind of asymmetry between giving people options and taking them away. And the analogy I've used is uh, when I moved to Madison 10 years ago, I had to very quickly decide how I was gonna get from my home on the west side to my office on campus. And so I consulted maps and figured out the best way it seemed to do that. And I've been driving that way for 10 years. Now, if the city of Madison decided to offer me additional routes, they built another bridge or added roads or something, that'd be a wonderful convenience. And, uh, and maybe I would take them up on it and begin driving a different way. But to do that, I would have to know about that option. So there has to be some education on my part to be aware of it. And then I would have to decide it's worth the effort to change what I've been doing each day to drive in a different way. That's sort of how early and absentee voting works, right? It's an additional option. Voters who had been casting ballots on election day or thinking about that now have additional places and ways to do that. But they have to be informed about it to take advantage, and there has to be an incentive to do it. But now think about the other side of that. What, imagine that the road that I take from home to work each day is suddenly closed. Now I'm forced to change my behavior. It's not as though I have an option to do something else. I have to change what I'm doing. It's very disruptive. And so taking away absentee and early voting, once people have adapted to it, uh, tends to have a bigger effect on turnout than does rolling it out in the first place. And in fact, a lot of the litigation has been about the rolling back rather than whether states ought to offer them in the first place. Another caveat is that there are lots of reasons to change election laws that have nothing to do with voter turnout. Election officials themselves aren't always interested in voter turnout. They're interested in lots of other things. They're interested in how much elections cost. They're interested in having an accurate count. Uh, they're interested in working with their partners, like schools and churches that have polling places and are inconvenienced on election day. They're interested in making the legislature happy, which funds their operations. Uh, voters like some things that aren't necessarily helpful to turn out. And so there may be other reasons to do what we're doing. Uh, in in the, some of the western states that are now doing their elections 
all by mail or mostly by mail, they feel like there's a lot of cost savings in doing that and that voters really appreciate the convenience that that offers. Whether it increases turnout or not is sort of a secondary concern. Okay, so these are multifaceted considerations. An another thing to consider is that the law on the books may not be the law that people experience in their interactions with the election system. The implementation of the law matters tremendously. And the prime example of this is something known as the National Voter Registration Act, or NVRA. You would know it as Motor Voter. This was a law passed over 20 years ago by the federal government that would allow people to register to vote when they're interacting at a DMV, getting a license or something else, or they're at a social service agency of some kind or a military recruiting station. It's supposed to be a seamless transaction where all of the information that's on the DMV form or the social service form automatically gets transferred to the voter registration form, and all a person needs to do is sign and they become registered. It turns out that law had very little effect on voter registration rates and no effect on voter turnout rates. And the reason is that it was terribly implemented. States, particularly DMVs, really resisted doing this. They felt as though their job was to look after motorists and automobiles and not to be registering people to vote. Uh, and there are paltry numbers of registration forms coming from DMVs to secretaries of state and election officials. There are a few states that do this well. There are a lot of states that have done this really badly. And the, the data just suggests there's almost no activity happening uh, from both DMVs and from social service agencies. There are now some lawsuits and some legal agreements that have nudged some states into changing their behavior. But this is a case where I think a well-intentioned national law really has had no teeth. Uh, because there's no one out there enforcing it. Finally, uh, I, I think a little bit about election laws the way I think about prescription drugs a person might take. You don't take them independently. Doctors and pharmacists think about the interactions of those drugs. How will one interact with the other? And we have to think about how a, one election law on the books is likely to affect or interact with another. Although my research suggests that early voting doesn't do much to increase turnout, it does show that election day registration does a lot to increase voter turnout. And the combination of those two things tends to on net be positive. In other words, the positive benefit you get from same day registration is greater than the negative effect you get from early voting. And so the combination can be really powerful. And so thinking about how these things interact is really helpful. One more and then questions. Uh, election laws, hugely important. I spend a lot of time thinking about them, testifying about them, studying them, teaching about them. Uh, they are not the most important factors, sadly, when it comes to driving voter turnout. Those are largely things that are outside the control of election officials. Things like what's happening in the campaigns, the, the things you'll be hearing in the rest of this election series, uh, the culture of the state, the demographics of the state or the region uh, tend to matter more. Okay, why don't I wrap there and I would love to take your questions and comments. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there are now about four states doing uh, what they call voting by mail. It's the wrong term because people are mostly not voting by mail. They're getting their ballots by mail. It's really the distribution of ballots by mail. So if you live in Colorado, Arizona, Washington, or Oregon, a ballot is just going to show up in your mailbox in most cases uh, without requesting it. So voters love that because it's convenient. They don't have to think about it. There's no planning. The thing just shows up. Uh, election officials like it because it's inexpensive, it's efficient, it uh, doesn't require polling places, doesn't require voting machines, doesn't require poll workers. So you save a lot of money. Election day is a very different experience in Oregon than it would be in Wisconsin. Uh, I think there are some real upsides, but also some real downsides. Uh, the number one downside is that it relies on the US Postal Service as the model for running elections. And we know the Postal Service has had some budget issues, has talked about cutting back service. Uh, there was a proposal, I think it was last year, to maybe not deliver mail on Saturday anymore. That last Saturday, right before Election Day, is a really important day for election mail. Uh, so that's a concern. And whether the US Postal Service will exist in the same form it does today in 10 or 20 years, we don't know. So putting all of your eggs in that basket, to me, seems risky. And I don't think FedEx is going to, or UPS are going to be options to replace the Postal Service. Um, one example of this, in Colorado, they've just gone to all mail balloting. And there are two US Postal Service distribution centers in Colorado, one in the eastern part of the state, one in the western part of the state. They closed the one in the western part of the state and moved it to New Mexico, 
So if you're a voter living in Western Colorado, you get your ballot in the mail, you, you fill it out, drop it back in the mail, it gets sent to New Mexico for processing and then returned back to the state. So you have a ballot leaving the state, which raises some concerns, and it just adds some time to processing. So I think those are the worries. It's really about the mail system. But my God, voters love it, and you know, it's, it's sending them out, the ballots out by mail, but returning them, there are just so many options. Uh, you can mail it back in. There are drop boxes all over the place in places like Oregon and Washington to drop the ballot. On election day, there are some special centers that open up to receive ballots. Um, it looks like it increases voter turnout to some degree. So lots of upsides, but also, I think, some real concerns. What about fraud? Um, I think the states that are doing all mail balloting have great systems to prevent fraud. Really high tech. Every ballot has a barcode. It's scanned. A voter can track their ballot at any point online to know where it is and whether it's been counted. So there, there's just a lot of thought put into that process. Where I worry about ballots in the mail is in states that don't do a lot of it, that haven't gone wholeheartedly to absentee voting. States like Wisconsin, where maybe 10 or 20 percent of voters vote by mail, those ballots tend to not be as secure. Uh, they're, out, I mean, they're, they're outside the custody of the state, right? They're put into the mail system, and at some point you hope you get them back and can count them. Uh, but if I were making policy to try to deal with the security of the voting system, it would be, every, I think everyone who studies this would say absentee ballots are the place to begin. That's the most vulnerable part of the system, not voter impersonation or other kinds of things. But the states that have jumped all in are doing a great job. Question. That's right. There's, I was just telling my students this yesterday. There is no federal requirement that you have to be a citizen to vote in US elections. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in federal law. But every state has decided to make it a matter of state law. So every state in the union has its own law that says you have to be a citizen to vote. But non-citizens, as you say, can get driver's license, uh, do pay taxes, may serve in the military. Uh, there are a few localities around the, around the U.S. that have allowed non-citizens to vote in local elections, city elections or school board elections or something else. But for the most part, non-citizen residents are in this weird territory of having a lot of opportunities and some requirements placed on them by living in the U.S., but not having the right to vote. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I don't think there's any appetite among policymakers to let non-citizens vote. They may not. No. no. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one reason that I think the voter ID laws are not well constructed. A, a, a person can have an ID who's not an eligible voter, right? Someone who's not 18, who's not a citizen, who's a felon, who, you know, is not a resident of that state, can have identification that shows who they are, and all it requires is a, a photo, and it's government issued, and it matches. Uh, so that that doesn't prevent non-citizens from voting. Right? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't prevent felons from voting. It, it really is targeted at people impersonating other voters. So that's why I say I think those laws are not well tailored to the problems that we might actually have. Other questions? Yeah. Did you see that right? There were 135 contested fraud voting? Yeah, so this is, uh, let me take you back to that figure. Yeah, so this is a heroic work that Justin Levitt did over a number of years to try to actually measure voter fraud. There are a lot of accusations, assertions about how much is happening. And he said, well, let's go find out. And so he spent a lot of time tracking down accusations. Sometimes these are just accusations that a candidate makes or a party makes or a group makes. You know, I think I saw something bad happening or it's a newspaper report. And he actually went through all the legal documents and tried to find evidence that somebody was prosecuted or there was something real or a trace of evidence. And he, and, he, and he actually did a nationwide survey where he asked people like me or a journalist, if you, if you know of any cases, send them to me. I'm trying to gather these things. And he ended up writing a piece for the Washington Post and then this follow-up story. And by last count, he had 35 cases that looked like credible, possible cases of voter impersonation. So very low rate. Yes. 
Yeah, it's, it's considered. The question is, have we talked about doing districting by computer? Just take humans out of the process altogether. Um, there are some computer scientists who think we could do that. Policymakers are very reluctant to hand over that process to a machine. I think there's just a lot of concern about that. Uh, a lot of these districting, there are now a fair number of districting programs that have a kind of automated side to them where maps can be drawn automatically. And in fact, in this uh, efficiency gap measure, where were we? Here, one way to judge how bad a map is is to have a computer draw a bunch of maps and then compare the real one to that and see whether the real one looks like, a bu like the ones the computer produced or it's a real outlier. It's far away from the other kinds of maps we get. So I don't think states are willing to do it just yet. Um, but there are at least academics and computer scientists studying the problem who think it's plausible down the road. Other questions all the way in the back. It is. It's, it's, it's funny how regional it is. It's really happening in the western part of the U.S., but it's just taken over. Even in states that don't officially have voting by mail, in the western part of the U.S., there's a lot of it happening. I think in California, fewer than half of voters are going to polling places. There's going to be a whole generation of people who grow up who have never been in a bank and have never been to a polling place. <laughs> and that has a lot of benefits, but maybe some downsides, too. We have time for another one or two? If you have any friends from Europe, from European democracies, they think we're nuts because they have to show ID in many of those countries to vote. And it's not a, it's not a thing. It's not a debate. Uh, it's, a, it's a national requirement. Everyone has an ID. It's issued by the national government in most cases. So there's not a disparity in who has those things. And it just happens. So the US is a wild outlier in that we generally don't require photo ID, except in a few of these states. And it's because there's nobody in charge of producing the IDs. There's no federal agency that's issuing them. There's no national election agency, period, that's in charge of US elections. It's very much run by the states. And every state is doing something differently. And we're essentially repurposing agencies that were designed for some other reason to be the distributors of IDs. DMVs were in charge of regulating motorists and automobiles. They now have become the providers of election documents to identify someone at the polls. Uh, or fishing licenses, gun licenses in Texas are acceptable. Again, it's other agencies that are doing these things. So it's, it's a cobbled together process. And that's why, we, that's why it's contentious and there's litigation, is that there's unequal ownership of the IDs. Uh, there were some proposals after the 2000 election meltdown. There were some bipartisan proposals to produce a national ID, where one agency in Washington would use social security numbers or something, tax records, and produce IDs. But that was shot down pretty quickly. So I think we're going to continue to be an outlier. Uh, forever. I don't see this changing right away. Last question? I seem to recall that there's some requirement, I'm probably not, I'm not sure if it's federal, but states come up with um, statewide voter registration lists in, in a computerized system. Is that happening? And if so, is it, what's the expectation about that helping in terms of getting people registered? Yeah, you're, you're correct. Uh, after the 2000 election mess, uh, federal law was passed called the Help America Vote Act in 2002. And that required every state, except North Dakota, to create a voter registration list. North Dakota is exempt because it doesn't have voter registration. So states that didn't have a, a statewide database had to create one. Wisconsin was one of those states. Wisconsin only had voter registration required in larger communities, communities with more than 5,000 people. So actually, most of the state of Wisconsin and of Minnesota didn't have voter registration until 10 years ago. But they're required to have the statewide list, so it's now everywhere. Uh, that has a lot of upsides and a lot of downsides. The upside is you have a, a computerized list, and it can now interact with the DMV list or Social Security or other databases. 
And that's allowing states like Oregon to register everybody, just do it automatically. It's also letting some states do online voter registration, where a person could just go on the website, and because they have a driver's license or state ID number, they can register. Uh, the, the downside is it's raised these debates about how you maintain those lists. When does someone warrant getting kicked off? Is it because they haven't voted in a couple of cycles? Because you have evidence that they've died? Because you have evidence that they moved away or they registered in a different place? That has been the source of debate in Ohio this summer. There was just a decision last week. There have been endless decisions about the Ohio case, about whether the Secretary of State there is being too aggressive in purging people from the rolls. And the ACLU has been fighting on one side and the state on the other. I think that's not quite at its end. But that's one of the consequences of having the databases. So like everything else today, it's a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. Thanks for having me.